it's day 32 and we're going to look at how we can store more than one piece of information in a single variable. We're going to look at lists. Now a big concept in computer science is the idea of an array. That's a data structure and that's a very fancy word but all that really means is it's going to be a place where we can store more than one thing under the same variable name. Now Python doesn't really have this concept of arrays, it has a much more flexible and a much more powerful concept called lists. Lists are literally lists of items. You can put any piece of data from any data type into a list and you can extract it and remove it or change it. It's a remarkably flexible way of working. We're going to start from a very simple form. Now you might be wondering, well, what's the point of this? Well, sometimes you don't know how much data you need to store. Sometimes you need to store loads of data and we can use a loop to move through the data in a list reasonably quickly, efficiently, and most importantly, without us having to manually tell it how many things are in the list in the first place. As far as the computer is concerned, a list looks a bit like this. Lists inside Python are zero indexed and this is a special term that means we start counting the first item as number zero and that feels a little bit weird but you'll get used to it. Computer scientists tend to start counting from zero not to waste any numbers that we happen to have. Unfortunately it really does become second nature to start counting from zero sometimes. The amount of times I've booked the wrong number of people for a restaurant is shocking. So the first element in the list is index zero and you'll notice it goes up as we move down. If I want to put something directly in one of these boxes, I can directly address it by using square brackets. The variable name followed by square brackets and the index number of the row will allow us to access that piece of data just like it was a standard variable. I can also print out the data in the same way. We'll start by flashing back to school where we needed to keep a timetable of the lessons that we were going to attend throughout the day. We're going to build that in a list and see how that works. I'm going to start by declaring my variable in the standard way. In this case I've called it timetable and I'm going to set it equal to a list. We define a list as being within square brackets. Now notice they are square brackets not the rounded kind of brackets, the parentheses that we've used before. That has a very different meaning. It means this is a list. And then within the list, we can write the list of the subjects that we would have studied. So for instance, maybe my timetable happens to start with computer science. And notice I'm putting this in quotes, just like we would normally because it's text. I've put a comma between the item and I'm going to go for my second lesson, which is going to be math. Then maybe a bit of English and a bit of art followed finally by sport to finish my day off. Now let's start by seeing what happens if I just print that out because just like normal I can print out my timetable. If I run it, ah, now that looks a bit strange doesn't it? It's actually just printed out for us all the code including the square brackets and the commas. If this was the way most computer programs worked, people would constantly be confused. My nan would be calling me up day and night to say, I've been given a load of random symbols and commas and square brackets and stuff, what's going on? And I'd be constantly fielding these questions. Luckily, that's not the reason I went bald. That was pure genetics. In actual fact, what we have to do as programmers is tell the computer which index to print out. As we're zero indexed, which means we start counting from zero, if I wanted to print out math, I'd put a square bracket directly at the end of timetable and inside those square brackets I'm going to write the index number that I want to print out. In this case math is the second item, so we start counting from zero, zero is computer science, and one is math. If I put a one in here, that would allow me to print out math. And that looks a bit nicer. Now we could use this method to print out the entire timetable if we wanted to. 
And there we go, our day's timetable is printed. We can also use this method to change it whilst it's running. Line one has built our timetable, but if throughout the year somebody says to me, David, you know what? You're not exactly a sportsman. Let's get you doing something else. You're embarrassing us on the football field, my friend. I'd say fair enough. Absolutely, I'll do it. Let's change it. But how do we do that? Well, in the same way that we change the entire variable, by doing something like that, we can change an index by calling it with the square brackets. So sport is index four. I'm gonna use a single equals to change that. I'm saying in the list timetable at index four, change it to what would I rather do instead of sport? And I've changed it. It's not changed the way it prints though. Now that is because of the order that this code is executing. I have created the timetable on line one. I have printed out that timetable on lines two to six. I've then gone and changed the timetable on line eight, but I haven't printed out the changed version. Let's do that. There we go. Now I've got a much more fun activity to do at my last lesson of the school day. Well, that's great and all, but who wants to be writing all those print statements? Let me show you why lists and loops are best friends. Yes, they are the Bert and Ernie of the programming world. Instead of this amount of lines, because again, remember, the problem with this is if I suddenly get a new lesson added to my timetable, it's not going to print that out at all because we haven't told it to. And this is a limitation. This is the same kind of limitation we'd have if we stored each of those lessons as a separate variable. But loops fix that. Let's get rid of all that code and we'll exchange it for two lines. I'm gonna say for lesson in timetable. Now you remember that for loops work by creating the variable immediately after the word for, and setting it to each value in a list. So far, we've only ever done numbers because we've used the range function to build us a list of numbers. Now, we've actually given it a list. We've said, make lesson each value within this list, and then do something. What can we do? Well, I'm gonna print out the lesson. Notice that printed out the entire list. Now, no matter how many things I actually have in that list, our for loop with two lines of code is always gonna print out everything in it. And of course, I could have some extra code in there, put an if statement in nested to say something interesting about the specific lesson. Okay, common problems then? Well, you can imagine the number one common problem with lists is that they start counting from zero, which does confuse a lot of people. In this example, I've used an F string to print out the first color. What do I get? So this program seems to claim the first color in my list is orange, when actually the first color on my list is red. So what's happening here? Well, the issue is the index in the square brackets. The square bracket index is zero indexed, meaning that the first item is zero. So if I want to print the first item out, that has to be zero. And it works. There are more problems that stem from that index value, and some of them are a little bit more serious. In this case, I'm trying to access the color violet, and that is going to be the last color in my list. I've made the mistake again of starting counting from one. So I'm one number higher than I need to be. But watch what happens when I run this. Ah, a proper crash. It's saying the list index is out of range, which is the technical term of saying, you've told me to go to index six and there ain't anything here, sunshine. What do you expect me to do other than just crash? Well, fair play to it. 
but it throws its hand at the pram. You'll see this error a lot as you deal with lists, especially as you forget the indexing as we go. Now, the way to fix this, of course, is to make sure that we remember our zero indexing and that the sixth item in the list is actually index five, and we get the result. Once again, I've accidentally broken some of my own code. See if you can fix it for me. Our challenge for today, I would like you to manually create a list that stores a greeting in a number of different languages. You can start with a language that you speak and then go and use translate features on the internet to find a bunch of different greetings. What I'd like you to do then is bring in the random library, generate a random number between zero and the maximum number of items in your list. And then at random, when I click run, print out one of the greetings. It shouldn't crash. It shouldn't do any weirdness. And ideally, I'd like to see you using an F string to do this, to get some practice in with using that fantastic way of outputting data. Once you're done, please share it with us in the community by publishing it and using the hashtag replit 100 days of code when you're sharing it. Now, you may be thinking, well, thank you for showing me this, but it's all a bit manual and it's a bit boring and I just don't see the point. Well, tomorrow we're going to look at dynamic lists. That is a list that you can add stuff to and remove things from without having to manually specify where it's located. And this gives us much more power over what we can do with a list.